Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we begin a multi-part, mind-blowing interview with Dr. Gordon Edwards, head of the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility, and he talks about all the ways Canada has not been responsible with its nuclear materials. From uranium mining to double-dealing First Nations people, the country's involvement in the Manhattan Project to the radiologic waste buried in the path of the Fort McMurray wildfire, this is one of the densest, most information-packed interviews I have ever conducted for this show, and you won't want to miss it. Plus, there's our ever-popular Numbnuts of the Week, the Nuclear Reactor Duck, and Cover Report, and more honest nuclear information than could be found at California polling places any time today. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, June 7, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Let's start out with some really good news. Exelon has announced that it will move forward with what they're calling the early retirements, couldn't happen soon enough, of two nuclear power facilities in Illinois, Clinton and the two reactors in Quad Cities. They're blaming this on continued financial losses, totaling $800 million over the past seven years, despite them being two of the utility's best-performing facilities. I refuse to call them plants. Plants are green-growing things. They give us oxygen. They're good. Nuclear reactors do nothing that is good. Exelon has been trying for months to badger the Illinois state legislature, which is trying to cover up its own financial shortfalls in running the state, to give them millions of dollars to cover their operating losses. Hey, guys, that's a government subsidy. And that's not supposed to be the way a corporation operates, you know. They keep trying to calm people into thinking that nuclear energy is quote-unquote clean energy when it is actually the opposite of it. And what Exelon was pushing for was nothing less than a bailout. Take the money instead, put it into solar, put it into wind, and shut those puppies down. Exact dates to be announced but it can't happen too soon. And another piece of good news, the Seattle City Council this week told its utility, Seattle City Light Department, to move away from getting electricity from fossil fuels and nuclear energy, putting the two on par with each other. Thank you very much. That's the right step to take. Energy Northwest operates the Northwest's only nuclear power facility, the Columbia Generating Station near Richland. It is on the grounds of the Hanford nuclear site, the most contaminated place in the United States. Seattle only gets about 4% of its electricity from this nuclear facility. So you put in a couple more windmills, you'll get the energy that you need. I don't know that solar is that good a bet up in Seattle. The resolution was written by groups including Physicians for Social Responsibility and Heart of America Northwest. You can learn more about Hanford and Heart of America Northwest from Nuclear Hot Seat number 256 three weeks ago, where I interviewed its head, Jerry Paulette, and from Nuclear Hot Seat number 257, where we talked about Columbia Generating Station with Mimi German of No Nukes Northwest. The resolution in Seattle does make note of the workforce at the nuclear facility, saying that there should be retraining programs, retirement plans, and reassignment to decommissioning as part of a transition to clean, healthy, renewable electricity production. Well, we've used up the good news. Time to get on to the rest. A federal appeals court on Friday, June 3rd, rejected a plea from four states to overturn a regulation allowing long-term storage of spent nuclear fuel at power plants. The rule concluded that spent fuel rods and that spent 
belongs in quotes because there's still radioactive plutonium, weapons-grade plutonium, in all of these rods and fuel bundles. But the rule concludes that, quote-unquote, spent fuel rods can be stored safely at nuclear power plants indefinitely in exposed outdoor fuel pools. The ruling means that the NRC can continue to give nuclear facilities, both active and inactive, permission to store their fuel rods on site for as long as they need to, a.k.a. forever. The plea was filed by the Attorneys General of New York, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. In responding to this ruling, Kevin Camps, radioactive waste watchdog for Beyond Nuclear, said, We are sorely disappointed by Friday's ruling. The court did not seem to understand the very sound and forceful arguments our coalition of environmental organizations was making. Irradiated nuclear fuel remains hazardous for a million years, as acknowledged by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in its Yucca Mountain dump regulations. Exposure to highly radioactive nuclear waste, even decades after removal from an operating reactor core, at close range and with no radiation shielding, can deliver a fatal dose of gamma radiation in just minutes. Camps went on to say, The timing of the court's ruling is ironic. Just a couple of weeks ago, a National Academies of Sciences Fukushima Lessons Learned panel reported that high-level radioactive waste storage pools in the U.S. are at high risk of catastrophic fires, whether due to accident, natural disaster, or terrorist attack. In fact, such a mega-catastrophe was very narrowly avoided at Fukushima Daiichi by sheer luck, as the NAS panel reported. And a new research report out of Princeton using state-of-the-art meteorological computer modeling, confirmed that an American irradiated nuclear fuel storage pool fire could release such catastrophic amounts of hazardous cesium-137 that it would dwarf the Fukushima nuclear catastrophe by comparison. As longtime Missouri-based anti-nuclear activist and Beyond Nuclear board member Kay Dry has put it, We now have a mountain of radioactive waste 74 years high, and we don't even know what to do with the first cup full. It is time to stop making it. And now it's time for the nuclear reactor duck (coughs) and cover report. At Diablo Canyon in California on May 30th, There was a manual opening of reactor trip breakers due to rod position error greater than 12 steps. And we all know that 12 steps are the right number and you don't need any more. Unit 2 was in hot shutdown during its 19th refueling outage. And be aware that during refueling is when spikes happen in radiation. And the reason that these spikes don't show up on the reports to the NRC is because they're averaged out over a year, even though they take place in a very short period of time during the actual refueling when the rods are pulled out. In this case, there was something called Shutdown Bank A Group 1, which made a demand indicating 14 steps were called for. Group 2 demanded that 13 steps were called for. Something else indicated 12 steps were called for, and yet everything remained at step zero. They had not yet admitted they were powerless. (coughs) And at Susquehanna in Pennsylvania on June 6th, only yesterday, the main turbine was tripped, whoops, and the reactor put into hot standby. The licensee identified leakage from a weld on seal water line piping connected to the reactor recirculation pump seal area. Activities are continuing to achieve cold shutdown. And that's this week's nuclear reactor duck (coughs) and cover report. Researchers from Duke University have concluded in a newly released peer-reviewed study that thousands of oil and gas industry wastewater spills in North Dakota have caused widespread, that's their word, widespread contamination from radioactive materials along with heavy metals and corrosive salts, putting the health of people and wildlife at risk. 
Some rivers and streams in North Dakota now carry levels of radioactive and toxic materials higher than federal drinking water standards. High levels of the radioactive element radium was discovered near spill sites. The pollution was found on land as well as in water. The soils in locations where wastewater spilled were laced with significant levels of radium and even higher levels of radium were discovered in the ground downstream from the spill's origin points. This shows that radioactive materials were soaking into the ground and building up as spills flowed over the ground, the researchers said. All told, the Duke University researchers mapped out a total of more than 3,900 accidental spills of oil and gas wastewater in North Dakota alone. Nancy Lawler, a Duke University Ph.D. student who was lead author of the study, said, This has created a legacy of radioactivity at spill sites. In New York City today, June 7, nuclear experts, celebrities, and citizens groups advocating closure of Nuclear Point held a press conference to flag the imminent danger of the state giving large public subsidies to New York's nuclear industry by including it in its clean energy standard. Excuse me while I get my blood pressure under control. The plan which is ostensibly about accelerating growth of renewable energy in New York, would open a back door to an effective nuclear tax, requiring New York's electricity customers to contribute billions to bail out the state's privately owned, trouble-plagued nuclear fleet, potentially including Indian Point. Upstate New York's nuclear plants Fitzpatrick, Jinna, and Nine Mile Point are so unprofitable to run that their owners are threatening to close them unless they get additional ratepayer subsidies on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars per year. They're going to stamp their foot and pout and have a tantrum unless they get that money. Excuse me while I get my blood pressure under control. Fortunately, the nuclear experts, celebrities, and activists are on it. And now... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that sound a week. The United States doesn't know what to do with the radioactive nuclear waste that we already are stuffing to millions of millions over 75,000 tons of the stuff from nuclear reactors in this country. But that doesn't stop us from going after every last speck of the stuff that we can manage to ingather from the rest of the world. Which is to say, that shipment of plutonium from Japan, 331 kilograms of plutonium, arrived Monday, June 6th, at the South Carolina Savannah River site. This despite objections from the state's governor, Nikki Haley, that South Carolina was being used as a storage dump for these kinds of materials. Well, Nikki, that's because Texas, good old boys with business now in Texas, haven't opened their arms to embrace it yet. Along with the plutonium, a shipment of highly enriched uranium has also been transferred to the Y-12 National Security Complex near Oak Ridge, Tennessee. You know, the Fort Knox for uranium that was successfully broken into in 2012 by an 83-year-old peace activist nun and her two companions. Sister Megan Rice got in using bolt cutters to get through the chain-link fence and a Bible for her prayers. Yeah, there's a whole lot of safety going on at Y-12. But back to that plutonium at the Savannah River site, The shipment consists of plutonium that was supplied to Japan in the 1960s and 70s for nuclear reactor research purposes. Governor Haley has a long-standing dispute with the federal government over the long-term storage of nuclear materials. To soothe her fevered brow, U.S. Energy Secretary Ernest Moni Modis told her that six metric tons of plutonium stored at the site would ultimately be permanently stored at listen to this, at a New Mexico facility that is slated to be up and running later this year. Sounds like we've got something new and efficient and bright and sparkly to store this radioactive waste that's going to be brand 
brand spanking new come later this year. But what he's referring to is the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, the WIP site, which has been down since February 14, Valentine's Day of 2014, because of a little thing known as the explosion of a 55-gallon drum of radioactive waste from the Los Alamos National Lab that then contaminated the entire underground, went up a ventilation stack that did not have the HEPA filters turned on for 33 minutes, and thus spewed plutonium and americium into the air in the local community. Congratulations, Carlsbad. So, Moni Moni's is still flogging that dead horse that Whip is going to be up and running by the end of the year, which it probably will not. He's just trying to save the illusion of his legacy so that when the next person who becomes president kicks him out of office, he'll still at least look good on his resume when he looks for his next position. Which is to say... We don't need no stinking rad waste from any place else on Earth. We've got enough of our own. We can't do anything with it. And that's why whoever authorized this ingathering of Japanese plutonium back to the United States, back to Governor Nikki Haley's state, back to the Savannah River site, and heaven help us, the Y-12 National quote-unquote security complex near Oak Ridge, Tennessee, whoever that person is or whoever those people are, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's of the week. Over to Japan where, according to recent reports, children living in Fukushima Prefecture are significantly more likely to suffer from thyroid cancer after the Fukushima nuclear disaster, despite denial by Japanese authorities. The rate of children suffering from thyroid cancer in Fukushima Prefecture was as much as 20 to 50 times higher than the national average as of 2014 three years after the disaster began, according to Toshihide Tsuda, professor of environmental epidemiology at Okayama University. More than 160 teenagers in Fukushima Prefecture have been diagnosed with thyroid cancer. The number will almost certainly continue to increase with the passage of time, according to Tsuda's findings, which were published in the electronic edition of the journal of the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology. Over to China, where in Beijing on June 3rd, a spokeswoman for the Chinese Foreign Ministry said that China is highly concerned about possible pollution of the oceanic environment after the nuclear accident in Fukushima began in 2011. According to the spokeswoman, China has requested that the Japanese government adopts effective measures to provide the international community with timely, complete, and precise information. Good luck on that one. She said, Our country expects that Japan maintains a strong sense of responsibility towards its own people and the people of neighboring countries. Good luck on that. China also requested that the International Atomic Energy Agency increase the monitoring of radioactive water. Good luck on that. We will have lots of links up on the website on resuspension and atmospheric transport of radionuclides due to wildfires near the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in 2015. Chernobyl's high radiation levels found in Belarus milk 30 years after the disaster. Ukrainian children are eating food tainted by Chernobyl radiation. And a link to Harvey Wasserman's article on EcoWatch.com, What Will Finally Shut Down Diablo Canyon Nukes? Could a Bernie Win Help? We'll have the week's featured interview in just a moment. But first, just one week to go until the five-year anniversary of Nuclear Hot Seat. And here's your chance to join the celebration. As I gently remind you each week, Nuclear Hot Seat relies on you, the listeners, to help us meet our expenses and keep going and growing. No amount is too small or too large. Go ahead, knock yourself out if you want. Because all that helps us to continue to bring you the best verifiable nuclear information flavored with our unique perspective and just a dash of attitude. 
all write a lot of attitude. I do like to spice things up. I also ask each week for you to consider sending the show what I call a Starbucks donation, the equivalent of what you'd pay for a cup of coffee and a nice tip to the server. And if you feel up to it, add in the amount that you would spend on a nosh. Send it once. Consider making it monthly. Now, what can this go for? I'm so glad you asked. Under the guidance of a social media coach, I'm learning how to place targeted boosts on Facebook to reach new listeners with each week's episode. And it's working. Each boost reaches several hundred new people, and I can target zip codes that match what the featured interview is focused on. The best part is that each boost costs only $5 a day, the same as a Starbucks donation. So if you can help me get Nuclear Hot Seat in front of potential audiences that right now don't even know the show exists, we'd really appreciate it. So buy us that imaginary cup of java by going to NuclearHotSeat.com, click on the big red Donate button, and know that whatever amount you can offer, I take it as a pledge of faith in the show, and I'm really grateful to you for it. Sometimes... Even if I know an interview is going to be good, I have no idea how good until it happens. This one is a doozy. Dr. Gordon Edwards is president of the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility and one of Canada's best-known independent experts on nuclear technology. Since he became involved with uranium issues in 1977, he has worked with the Canadian government, First Nations Tribal Councils, consulted with both governmental and non-governmental bodies, and spoken internationally at conferences sponsored by Physicians for Global Survival and International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, among many other groups. He gave me an astonishing two hours of his time for our talk, which covered how intertwined Canada has been with the U.S. development of the nuclear bomb, as well as issues involving reactors, uranium mining, accidents, and attempted cleanups, of course the waste storage issue, and so much more. As this is only a 60-minute show, I've had to break our interview at least in half, with the rest of it appearing on an upcoming episode of Nuclear Hot Seat. For now, fasten your seatbelt. It's going to be quite a ride. Dr. Gordon Edwards, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. My pleasure. Let's start out with a little bit about your background and how you first became involved in working on nuclear issues. Yes, well, I graduated originally from university in mathematics, physics, and chemistry, a triple major um, with a gold medal in mathematics and physics. And I went on to study mathematics at the postgraduate level, getting a Ph.D. in mathematics in 1972. But along the way, I also got involved in the question of the social responsibility of the scientist, and in particular, the question of the survival of the planet, threatened first and foremost by weapons of mass destruction, and also by ecological disasters such as global warming and the poisoning of the oceans and so on. So I was a co-founder of a group in 1970 called Survival and I became the editor of an international newsletter called Survival, which was trying to build bridges between scientists and non-scientists to recognize that we have to really put our energy into saving ourselves and the planet and all other forms of life on Earth by trying to reverse some of the most damaging developments in science and technology. Now, it was only gradually that I learned the relationship between peaceful nuclear power and the mining of uranium which leads directly to nuclear weapons. In fact, we in Canada were the host of the very first uranium mine in the entire world, which was in the Northwest Territories of Canada. It used to be a radium mine back in 1930. They were mining radium for uh, its properties. But then, in 1938, it was discovered that nuclear fission was possible using uranium, which is the granddaddy of radium, and that uh, you could make an extremely powerful bomb with this material. So that's when Canada got into the uranium business, and we actually supplied the initial uranium that was used in the Manhattan Project to build the world's first atomic bombs. And our production of uranium boomed after the end of the war, 
And up until 1965, all of the uranium mined in Canada was used for nuclear weapons. And it was a big business. It was the fourth leading export from Canada after wheat and timber and pulp for paper came uranium. So it was a very big business, and it was all for bombs. Were these bombs solely for the United States, or were other countries involved as well? The United States was the main customer. They certainly brought most of it. But we also were in close collaboration with the United Kingdom. And in fact, we played a key role in the initial phases of learning how to use plutonium, learning how to separate and produce plutonium in the most efficient way. That was done here in Montreal, where I live, in a secret laboratory during World War II on the slopes of Mount Royal. There were teams of scientists from... Britain, from France, and from a few other European countries, working together with Canadian scientists in collaboration with the Manhattan Project in the United States to figure out the best ways of producing and separating plutonium. And it's because of this work that both the French and the British, after the war, led the world in plutonium separation technology, which is called reprocessing. They were actually ahead of the U.S., And the reason why was because the best techniques were developed here in Montreal. All of this uranium mining must have been taking and continue to take a tremendous toll on the environment and the people in it. How has this played out from the earliest days of both the mining and the tailings and the shipping of the material through the country? Well, uh, you're quite right. It's a strange coincidence, perhaps not a coincidence, that all over the world, the most intensive uranium mining takes place on land which is either occupied by Aboriginal peoples or very adjacent to Aboriginal lands. That's true in Australia. It's true in Canada. It has been true in the United States, down in the Navajo country, and it has been true in other parts of the world. And here in Canada, the Native people indeed suffered the heaviest toll in terms of what is called the front end of the nuclear fuel chain, the mining and extraction of uranium. The world's first uranium mine was up in Great Bear Lake. As I said before, it started as a radium mine, but it was converted to uranium mine after World War II began. And the native people there who had lived there for thousands of years as nomad, nomadic existence around the shores of this enormous lake, which takes eight hours to cross using a barge, They were hired at a rate of around a dollar a day to carry bags of radium concentrates and then later uranium concentrates on their backs. They were never told that there were any dangers to this practice. And when they put the sacks onto the barge to ship them across the lake, they would lie on these sacks and go to sleep while the barge was crossing the lake, which took about eight hours. And then when they got to the other side, they would unload from the one barge and put it onto a smaller barge, which is a river barge. And then they would sail at about 2,000 kilometers down to a juncture where they could put it on a train and send it to a small town in Ontario called Port Hope, which is where the world's only real refinery existed at that moment in order to actually refine this material for use in the weapons program. And those workers, many of them developed cancer and died from cancers of all kinds, And, in fact, the village came to be known, the village is known as Delaney is the name of it, but it came to be known as the village of widows because there were so many men who died. And when there were spills, for example, the men would sometimes, the the bags would tear open and they would be covered with this yellow dust, and they were never told to wash it off. There were no instructions to get rid of those clothes and to clean themselves thoroughly. They just were treated, treated as if it was regular dust. And even the women would sometimes retrieve the old burlap sacks and take them into their homes in order to reuse the material, part of recycling, you know. And these materials, of course, were very dangerous. They were radon generating. They were also rich in radium, which is a causer of bone cancer and leukemia and also head cancers. It was particularly tragic because the Dene culture, which they belong to, is a grandmother and grandfather-based culture meaning that traditionally it's the grandparents who teach the children. The parents are the disciplinarians and the providers, and the grandparents are the teachers. They tell the children the old stories, teach them the old lore, 
with no grandparents, you really are committing a kind of a cultural genocide, not only a toll in human lives, but also a, a terrific blow to the culture. So that was just one example. There were also other areas. Uh, for example, later on, the uh, uranium mining moved to northern Saskatchewan, just in the northernmost reaches of Saskatchewan, a place called Uranium City, which is now a ghost town. And there the tailings, the radioactive waste, were just dumped into the lake, allowed to go into the river, or were stored on the surface and allowed to blow around freely. There was really no regulation of these things at that time. And subsequently, in Ontario, there's a region called the Elliott Lake region, which is just above uh, Georgian Bay. And that became the center of uranium mining for a good part of Canada's early history in the 50s and 60s, when we were still mining for bombs. And, but making the transition, in 1965, the Prime Minister of Canada at that time was uh, Prime Minister Pearson. And his actually, his riding was Elliott Lake, Ontario, where the uranium mines were. And he declared that henceforth, from that day forward, no more uranium would be sold for weapons use. It would only be sold for peaceful purposes. So Canada officially changed its policy in 1965. And nevertheless, some Canadian uranium still found its way into bombs, not by direct routes, but by indirect routes. And once again, up in the uh, Elliott Lake area, there were the Serpent River Indian tribe. And the Serpent River Indian tribe was right downstream from the Serpent River system, which has about 18 lakes on it. And this entire 55-mile stretch of water, this river system, with the 18 lakes, became totally contaminated and unusable. It became veritably a biological desert. They had to install a radium removal plant for the white people who lived on one side of the river, but they didn't have to install a radium removal plant for the native people because the white people were under provincial legislation and the province had tighter standards than the federal government. And so the Indians on the other side of the river were considered to be okay because they were within the federal standard. Traditionally in Canada, we have had lax standards in radioactive materials. We still do today. For example, our, our standards for many things are much more lax than they are in some other countries. What, if any, follow-up has there been with the Native peoples in Saskatchewan and elsewhere as regards the health through the generations and the impact of radiation from the uranium mining on them? There really has been no systematic study of intergenerational, for sure. All they do in terms of health studies is to look at the statistical incidence of cancer and, of course, as anybody who deals with statistics knows, when you look at a small population, and we are talking here about small populations, when you look at a small population, it's very difficult to get statistically significant results. So the, the result is that you may get an increase in cancer, but you say, well, it's not statistically significant. Therefore, the agencies and the uranium companies can get away with saying that there's no difference. Well, what they mean is no statistically significant difference between the cancer rate in this community compared with the cancer rate for the population at large. But this is done very, we feel, quite imprecisely, and oftentimes the results, when they are done, are misrepresented. Just this last month, I wrote a letter to the Atomic Energy Authority here, the Nuclear Regulatory Authority, which is called the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, they had made a presentation to some Quebec officials saying that the evidence showed, the scientific evidence showed, that there was no greater lung cancer risk among uranium miners in the modern era than in the normal Canadian population. And they were citing a study which they themselves commissioned, and that study did not reach the conclusion at all. That study showed that, in fact, there was a 34% increase of lung cancer mortality compared with the Canadian population, the regular Canadian population. So even when they have statistically significant results, they very often misrepresent them to the decision makers. Given that the mining took place in areas that then had to transport the uranium over distance, what was the level of contamination along the way, and especially the destination, such as Port Hope? Yes, well... <laughs> It's quite a mess, in fact. 
we're talking about a very long time interval because the mine opened originally in 1930. It switched to uranium in, in around 19, early 40s, and then it was operating up until the 50s. But it wasn't until 2008 that I was asked to go to this town of Delaney, where the Denny people live, and well, along with my friend Robert Del Tredici, the wonderful nuclear photographer, founder of the Atomic Photographers Guild, we both went up there and we explained in a three-hour session to the native people there, the Dene, what the uranium had been used for. They were very shocked to learn that it had been used to destroy human beings halfway around the world. And also what the dangers of the uranium leftovers were that they themselves uh, were suffering from the health consequences from these materials, bone cancers they had and lung cancer and various other cancers typical of radium contamination. So when that came to light, there was a great deal of publicity generated by this. There was a TV program made called The Village of Widows. There were journalistic efforts. There was also a delegation that went down to Ottawa from the Dene people asking them to please clean up the mess because the waste had just been dumped into the lake and left on the terrain without ever being cleaned up or retrieved. And they also felt so guilty that they had played even unconsciously a role in the atomic bomb that they sent a delegation of Dene elders to Japan to apologize to the Japanese people for their role in uh, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Meanwhile, they themselves had been decimated by the effects of radiation. Now, subsequent to this, the Canadian authorities set up a low-level radioactive waste management office, and they went up to the northern transportation route, and they found evidence of contamination all along the route in boats, in piers, on docks, all the way along the route. And we'll never know the total extent of the contamination because I believe that, in myself, I believe that a lot of this cleanup operation, as it was called, was in a sense a cover-up operation because I think they only retrieved the material that was evident. Like, you know, if you find a dock that's contaminated, it's only reasonable to assume that a whole lot of the stuff went into the water. But they didn't bother looking at the sediments. They just looked at the stuff that was on the surface. So it's sort of like going to a scene of a crime and removing the visible clues <laughs> without really getting to the bottom of things. At any rate, they collected some 43,000 cubic meters. That's one and a half million cubic feet of radioactively contaminated material, which they carried to Fort McMurray, which is now called Fort McMurray. At that time, it had a different name. And that was the jumping off point. That's where the material was loaded onto trains headed to Port Hope. So they now have that 43,000 cubic meters of material stored in Fort McMurray. And it's in a landfill just south of the town. And of course, recently there were those enormous fires raging in that area. They still are not completely out, I don't think. And mass evacuation. This material was buried in a corner, a specialized, a roped-off corner of the uh, landfill with special containment system and with about at least 25 centimeters of earth on top of it. And growing on the earth on top was uh, vegetation. So even though the fire would have burned the vegetation, it probably would not have dispersed the radioactive material underground, although it's very difficult to know for sure. You also have to bear in mind that radium has a half-life of 1,600 years. So even though that stuff may be possibly secure today, there's no guarantee it's going to be secure for the next 1,000 years or 2,000 years. Or Actually, when you have a half-life of 1,600 years, you have to multiply that by 10. So we're really talking about 16,000 years. 16,000 years, well, <laughs> when you look at the pyramids of Egypt, they're only 5,000 years old. So it's difficult to believe that this stuff is really safely secured for all time. Also in Fort McMurray, because they have a lot of oil exploration, you know, that's where the tar sands are, and they have some very powerful, much, much smaller, much more concentrated radiological sources that they use for exploration. And these materials are highly dangerous materials. They give off very powerful gamma rays. Some of them are cesium-137 sources concentrated cesium-137 in a sealed source. 
Others are what are called neutron generators. These would use very dangerous materials like polonium-210. Now, polonium-210 is a material that was used to assassinate uh, Alexander Litvinenko in London a number of years ago. And it's considered by Los Alamos Labs, polonium-210, to be incredibly 250 billion times more toxic than cyanide. And there's about 20 different locations in the Fort McMurray area where these sources are stored, and they would be useful to terrorists as dirty bomb material, material where it's not an atomic bomb, but it's a bomb where you just disperse highly dangerous radioactive material into the heart of a city, for example, which would cause panic, but also cause a lot of harm as well and be very difficult to decontaminate. As a result of that, just shortly into the Fort McMurray fire, after the evacuation had already taken place, they sent two special agents from Ottawa up to Fort McMurray to secure those uh, particular sealed sources, they're called. There have been stories about everybody going into that area had to sign a special paper, which is a non-disclosure paper, saying that they will not disclose anything that they see. And it's highly unusual, so there's a good deal of mystery around what is the purpose of that. Is that having to do with these radiological sources? We don't know. Perhaps it's just paranoia from the tar sands people. This is applied even to residents, even to people who are like nurses, people that you would not normally think would need to sign a non-disclosure agreement. There are areas in Canada, besides these docks that you mentioned that were part of the waste stream that ended up at Fort McMurray. There are locations that are still extremely contaminated today. Talk to us about first Port Hope and the situation there. Okay, well Port Hope is really the site of the world's largest uranium conversion plant. It's called a conversion plant. There's only about five of them in the the Western world and this is the biggest. It's been operating for a long time. In 1943, the reason why President Roosevelt and Winston Churchill met together in Quebec City under the auspices of our Prime Minister, who was at that time Mackenzie King, was to sign a secret agreement called the Quebec Accord. And the Quebec Accord was an agreement between these three countries to cooperate in building the world's first atomic bombs. The reason why Canada was involved in this is because Canada had the uranium. The only known sources of uranium at that time were Czechoslovakia, which had been invaded by the Germans, the Belgian Congo, which but Belgium had also been invaded by the Nazis. So there was really no source of uranium that you could buy uranium from. Canada, however, had this radium mine, and wherever there's radium, there's uranium. Moreover, Canada had built a radium refinery in Port Hope, and that radium refinery could easily be converted to be a uranium refinery. So the Americans and the British both ordered quantities of uranium from Canada. That was all refined at Port Hope, and the mine at that point was shut down, but they hastened to reopen it again up in the Northwest Territories. Meanwhile, as if by a stroke of good luck, the Americans discovered that there was a whole warehouse full of uranium concentrates from the Belgian Congo that had been stored on Long Island in a warehouse for safekeeping during the war by the owners of the mine in the Belgian Congo called Union Minier. So they sent this material to Port Hope to be refined. So it went from the Belgian Congo to Long Island, and then when it was discovered on Long Island, they sent it to Port Hope, Ontario to be refined so that it could be sent back to the United States for two purposes. One was to be enriched at Oak Ridge in order to be used for the Hiroshima bomb, which was made of highly enriched uranium. And the other was to provide fuel for the Hanford reactors out in Washington State, where the uranium would be transformed into plutonium, which could be used in the Nagasaki bomb, and first of all, the Trinity bomb that was the test for the Nagasaki bomb. So Canada played a key, a small but very important role in the supply chain for this material. Meanwhile, according to the Quebec Accord that was signed in 1943, there was a tripartite committee set up, and this committee consisted of three Americans, two British, and one Canadian. And they decided 
things having to do with the logistics of uranium and plutonium supply. And it was that committee that decided in 1944, in December of 1944, to give the permission to Canada to go ahead and build the first Canadian nuclear reactor at Chalk River, Ontario, which was called the NRX. That means National Research Experimental. The NRX reactor, which became the most powerful, the most efficient plutonium-producing reactor in the world after the war, because it didn't start up until after the war was over. In the meantime, Port Hope was heavily contaminated with the leftovers from all this uranium processing and the radium processing that went before it. And there were huge amounts of radioactively contaminated waste that were dumped into deep ravines, beautiful ravines around town, and also into the harbor, a beautiful harbor. It's a lovely little town. And it was also used over the years, and this is going into the 60s even, it was carted away by employees with the permission of the company. The company itself was Eldorado Nuclear, which was a totally government-owned company. It was a federally-owned company. And they gave permission for them to take this radioactive material and use it as building material. Oh my God. So they built lots of homes and schools and other buildings around town using radioactively contaminated materials from the uranium refinery. And the most sensational of these, this only came to light publicly in 1975, in 1975, they had to evacuate the elementary school of St. Mary's because it was discovered that the radon levels in the cafeteria of that elementary school were higher than those permitted in uranium mines. And the ones permitted in uranium mines were already totally unacceptable. <laughs> so uh, they had to evacuate this elementary school. And then they discovered that the reason why was because the whole playground and the foundations of the school had been built with radioactive fill from El Dorado. That led to a further investigation, and they discovered hundreds of homes that had very high levels of radon, unbelievably high levels of radon in the homes. They had to destroy many homes. They had to decontaminate many homes by digging up the foundations and removing the contaminated material. They had no place to put it, mind you. <laughs> So they just basically dumped it into slightly more secure piles than they had had previously because at least these piles were covered with plastic. Oh, um, like that's going to do anything. Well, at least it keeps the radon from getting out into the atmosphere. You know, like radon only has a half-life of 3.8 days. So anything you can do to slow down the radon, if you can slow it down by several weeks, then you have reduced the amount of radon that gets out by a factor of a 1,000. So it's not a pointless thing to do, although it's certainly not a satisfactory solution, certainly not in the long term. People have difficulty understanding the fact that radioactivity is a form of nuclear energy. When we see forest fires, like the Fort McMurray forest fire, or chemical explosions on the battlefield, like these improvised devices, these suicide bombers, and so on, all of that is chemical energy. Chemical energy is only from the electrons around the atoms. You know, atoms have a core called a nucleus, and then they have electrons going around them. Well, it's the exchange of electrons that causes chemical energy, and that's all that's involved in all the experiences that we have normally of harmful things. And, of course, not only harmful things, but beneficial things as well. But... In the case of radioactivity, the energy comes not from the electrons, but directly from the nucleus of the atom. So it's nuclear energy. And nuclear energy is caused by the so-called nuclear forces, which are millions of times more powerful than any chemical forces. So the result is it makes it hard for people to understand. This is why polonium-210 is 250 billion times more toxic than cyanide. It's because the force that's involved in producing nuclear radioactivity, radioactive emissions, is so much more powerful than any chemical force. And this is why, for example, when radium poisoning was first found in the radium dial painters, these teenage girls who were hired to paint the dials to make them glow in the dark using radium-based paint, they suffered an epidemic of bone cancer, and then before that, they suffered an epidemic of anemia, fatal anemia, the same thing that killed Marie Curie and her daughter, Irene. And they also suffered from something called radium jaw, which means that their teeth were falling out. And when the dentist tried to do work on their teeth, 
their jawbones would break because they were made porous by the effects of the radium. And the amazing thing was that when they did autopsies on these girls after their death, they found that the amount of radium in the entire body was only a few micrograms. That's like a few millionths of a gram of radium. Nevertheless, the radium had distributed itself through their entire skeleton to such an extent that you could take any bone in their body and put it on a photographic plate overnight in a dark room and it would take its own picture because of the radiation from the radium. So it's difficult for us ordinary mortals to realize the potency of this radioactive material in terms of causing damage. And now we get back to the fact that so much of this material was stored under plastic tarps at Port Hope. What has happened to it since that time? Well, it's been a festering sore, (laughs) as you can imagine. It's an interesting story because I participated in part of this. This all happened around 1975. In 1976, it came to light that the authorities had known about this for more than 10 years. They had been warned about it repeatedly. Even the army, the Canadian army, actually used the Port Hope Beach to train their young men in radiological detection and using radioactive detection equipment because they knew the beach was contaminated. But the residents did not know the beach was contaminated. So there was a great deal of duplicity going on. Let's see, I guess it was about 10 years later that they set up a special task force called a sighting task force. It had operated for three years, and they searched all over Ontario for a home for the radioactive waste from Port Hope because it was agreed by all parties that the Port Hope area was totally unsuitable for the long-term storage of radioactive waste. First of all, it was sloping down to Lake Ontario. There was a lot of seepage going on. The underground formations were not resistant to uh, migration of contaminants, etc., etc. So they were looking for somewhere else in Ontario, and the idea was that any community that was suffering from economic hardship, for example, if they wanted to get some benefits, some economic benefits, they could look into the prospect of accepting this Port Hope waste in exchange for benefits. It was sort of like a, um, an auction, if you like. You know, what do you want uh, in order to take care of the waste for us in a stable geological setting? And I went to several of these communities in order to give the other side of the coin, that is, what are the dangers, whereas, of course, the officials from the El Dorado refinery would go and tell them what the advantages were. And one by one, all the communities that expressed an interest dropped out. So they came up empty-handed after three years and about $3 million worth of effort. They came up empty-handed. Now they have finally decided to store the stuff in a special facility designed to last for 500 years just north of the town in precisely the location they said previously was unsuitable. And so now they are spending about approximately $2 billion, which is the largest environmental municipal cleanup in Canadian history, to gather together all this radioactive stuff. So they're going to, for example, around the harbor of Port Hope, they're going to put steel liners, and then they're going to dredge the sediment to get the radioactive material out of the sediment. We're talking here about a trillion cubic meters of material that was dumped into the ravines, and they also had to dig up whole roadways and bury the roadways as radioactive waste, not to mention certain homes and certain buildings. So all of this is going on even as we speak. So there's a $2 billion cleanup going on, and I guess that it's going to actually do the trick. That was Dr. Gordon Edwards of the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility. This was just the first part of our interview. We have approximately another hour that covers aspects of the nuclear industry you have not been thinking about and deserve to. We'll have a little bit from him in next week's anniversary show. And in one of the following episodes of Nuclear Hot Seat, We'll catch up with the rest of this extraordinary interview. If you want to visit his website, it's ccnr.org. Activist shout-out. Big actions taking place on the East Coast to get the Indian Point rust bucket, aging, leaking, bolt-cracking nuclear reactors shut down for good. 
congratulations to the groups that have come together to work on this, to get this point across to the NRC and the world, including Nuclear Information and Research Service, or NIRS, Radiation and Public Health Project, Hudson River Sloop Clearwater, Riverkeeper, Friends of the Earth, and others. It's great to see the collective membership of our movement working together to reach our common goals. Godspeed, safe journey, and total success to you. And this is a shout out to all of you. Stories out of Japan have been really thin lately, and I could use some help finding more. If you run across any, please post them to the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook page. Make certain it's the blog site that shows the logo. And I will definitely consider them for the future episodes. All help is greatly appreciated, and this is how we keep growing in our reach and our information sourcing. Here's today's final thought. I was just away for five and a half days up in the mountains of a national forest. And I'm still putting my thoughts together after having taken that much of a break from the rest of my life. So when I figure out what I want to say, I'll fill you in. And I'm willing to bet that's going to be next week. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, June 7, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from TriCityHerald.com, TheHill.com, BeyondNuclear.com, EcoWatch.com, PLEnglish.com, MiningAwareness.WordPress.com, OpEdNews.com, Dianuke.org, World Nuclear Association Policy Drones and PR Hacks, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, with the watchful eye kept on them by Erica Gray, and the activist community of Nuclear Hot Seat, who gather on our which you are all invited to visit and like. It's a great place to network with others who share your concerns, and if you're looking for information or contacts on nuclear issues in your area, that's where you reach out. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, and recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, ActivateMedia.org, PlanetExperts.com, on NewsZSentinel.com, and now broadcast over the FCC airways on WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. We are always looking for other stations and networks to connect with, so if you know an online news aggregator or community radio station or maybe some mogul billionaire who would like to sponsor me on satellite, that would be swell. If any of them would like to carry the show, put us in touch and we'll have a great conversation. You're welcome to check out our archive of 257 shows on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com, on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and on iTunes under Podcasts. If you sign up on the website for the free chapter from my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, you will receive notice of Nuclear Hot Seat via email every week. The full book is available on Amazon, and a reminder that your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news with attitude. So please, do what you can this week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear Hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. 
It's the bomb.